You know what the most dangerous thing in America is, right? Nigga with a library card. <laughs> This is the Most Dangerous Thing in America podcast, the show in which we read books by black authors and the talks about by a black author. And you can listen if you are black or not black. That is okay. This week on the podcast, we are reading The Delectable Negro by Vincent Woodard. And the subtitle is The Delectable Negro, Human Consumption and Homoeroticism Within U.S. Slave Culture. So, we're going to hop right in. This is going to be a four-part podcast. We're going to go back to back to back to back. That was four, right? And the reason is because it's only six chapters, but it's kind of awkward. There's an introduction and then five chapters, so that's not six chapters. That is, that is in fact, um, no, there is six chapters. There's an introduction and six chapters, so it's kind of weird to do one, two, Three, four, five, six, plus the introduction, because the introduction has so much in it. So on this first podcast, we're going to do introduction plus first chapter, and then we'll probably do two and three next week, four and five after that, and then six plus finishing thoughts at the end of it. And I just had a lot to say. I always have a lot to say on these nonfiction podcasts, and there's always just a lot to um, to research and think about. So for this one, I would say I did more thinking than researching because what's there is pretty much what's there. There wasn't so much to dig up uh, underneath what Vincent Woodard said. May he rest in peace. He unfortunately passed away after writing this book. So, okay. So yeah, so that's going to be the structure of the podcast. For this podcast then specifically, we're going to do the intro in the first chapter, like I said. And then at the end, I think I have two minor notes and then that'll be it, and it'll probably run longer than I want. And also, there there will be significant clicking, because there's a lot to highlight here, and uh, I'll definitely be clicking around and going to pages inside of the document. All right, so, um, The Delectable Negro, uh, in the introduction, Woodard lays out what he wants to prove. That's really what the introduction serves as, right? So, I mean, kind of like an academic paper, uh, where you have an abstract and an introduction, he's kind of just telling us what is to follow. And, I mean, that may seem obvious, but it's a little bit different than what you get with a lot of introductions, which are just kind of like bringing you, I feel like, into the world, not necessarily telling you, hey, here's this thesis that I'm setting out to prove. And I think the reason that Woodard feels like he has to set out to prove a thesis is because what he's trying to prove is a little bit hard to pin down, even that it's like that it's even that it's even um necessary or true. Like it's not going against the grain, and, and we'll get to it as we go along here. So uh, essentially, the the biggest the big two takeaways I would say from the introduction and what he's trying to prove are consumption is cannibalism. These two things are interchangeable and they should be interpreted that way and that is important, right? So that is an important concept to him. Now this goes back to me saying like the reason why I don't think it's um, necessarily an important thing. I think most people view consumption, if you are inclined to view uh, consumption as a thing that should be slowed down. Like if you think that we need to degrow, if you think that capitalism is wreaking havoc on the environment, on mental health, on physical brown people. If you think that's true, you probably don't need to be convinced or nudged very far to say consumption is capitalism. And really, who cares if you don't use the two words interchangeably if you already think consumption is bad, right? And then if you're on the opposite end of the spectrum and you don't believe those things, you're certainly not going to be nudged in that direction by this. So then who and what is this argument for and what insights does it provide? That is what we will get to. Uh, the second contention is that black bodies were in high demand, right? So again, there's the part that is not going to be debated by mostly anybody, right? Like even if you are a, a virulent racist, um, you're probably, not probably, you, you will admit that slavery happened, right? Even the dumb, uh, even the dumb racists say it happened. They'll just be like, oh, it wasn't as bad or everybody was enslaved at some point. 
but almost everybody will say that it happened, right? There's very few full-on slavery deniers. So that part isn't controversial. The controversial part or the part that, that Woodard is going to try to prove is um, homoeroticism, right? That this included and uh, is affected by homoeroticism. Okay, so uh, let's break down the introduction a bit more. My computer sounds like it's going to explode, but I don't think it's getting picked up on the mic, which is good. So here are a few of the critiques I have of those ideas that Woodard lays out in the introduction. Uh, the first thing is that, you know, I should start by saying that every single critique in, that I have of this book in all parts of this podcast, and I hope I only have to make this preference once, are coming from the viewpoint of somebody who believes that slavery is horrible, right? Uh, so, and it's sad that we have to <laughs> make that statement in 2023, but if you've ever listened to the podcast, you know that I think that slavery is terrible and the repercussions of it have been felt up to the present day, and that's, to me, a non-debatable fact. So I'm only debating this as like an intellectual exercise as a person who exists on the, you know, whatever, if you have to say left, the left or just the spectrum of person who believes that slavery was really bad. Not really a political talking point, right? Just a, a normal thing that we, and, and to be clear, I am liberal, but I, but I do think that this thing shouldn't be tied to politics. It really has nothing to do with politics. Slavery is bad, full stop, boom. American chattel slavery, uh, particularly horrible and worse than any other form of slavery that's ever been on the earth. Done. That's the end of the argument. So, uh, no one's arguing against that, right? And there are people who need to know how absolutely heinous slavery was. Most of them live in Florida. So, no one's... I'm not arguing here that, like, we don't need to learn about slavery. It's not what I'm arguing against. What I am arguing against is something that I'm starting to call, like, uh, the Kyrie Irving corollary. Because, for me, right... Public school, uh, born in, born in 85, went to a public school in California. The version of slavery that I was taught was that it was really fucking bad. I didn't get some other version of slavery. Now, I know in, in Florida now, you can get a different version of slavery. The Aunt Jemima, um, whitewashed Frederick Douglass version of slavery where, you know, slavery taught me how to be a blacksmith and uh, thank God the white man saved me from Africa or something like that. But that's not the way I was taught slavery. I was taught it was bad. And the reason I'm calling it the Kyrie Irving corollary is because there was this thing that happened where he, you know, he got into that conspiracy theory where he got red-pilled into thinking that slavery was this other thing. Not that it wasn't bad, but that it was this other conspirator, conspirator, <laughs> conspiratorial thing and my point is, why? Like, why do I need that? Why do I need to think that slavery was worse? It's already bad. It's already very, very bad. Uh, the official line on slavery is very bad. You know, again, outside of Florida. But for most of my life growing up, especially if you grow up in a black environment, Unless your your dad and mom are like staunch uh, Thomas Sowell fans, or you know they really like Clarence Thomas, which uh, I just now made the connection that it's kind of funny that both of them have Tom in their name. Anyway, um, unless they're unless those are them, unless those are they, because even if you were in a Bill Cosby pound cake house, you would still wouldn't be taught that slavery. Because I just don't know how any black person can grow up thinking. Get in a version where slavery isn't very bad. Unless you are literally the the child of uh, a, uh, one of those race-baiting grifters who exists now because they can make money on social media. So, the point being there, um, at a certain point, the intelligent, uh, standard viewpoint on slavery is enough for me. Right? So, that's a critique of the book in this way. He, Vincent Woodard is an academic and an intelligent person, nothing like Kyrie Irving. 
but I'm just going that far to say, Woodard is not suggesting a conspiracy, right? But he is, however, suggesting a reading of first-hand accounts with the explicit idea that consumption equals cannibalism and homoeroticism was uh, more present than other scholars have been willing to um, say, estimate, uh, extract, excavate, I think is the word he uses. And, and so in so doing, he's doing it in the same way that you read a film through a Marxist lens, something like that. So it is not that, uh, and, and then and in that way, then it becomes like a question of the original document and its intent. You know, it's almost like a, uh, a Barthian reading of, of history. And okay, you know, fine. Um, I don't know that it's necessary. I also don't know that it's going to be successful. That's a lot of proof. A lot of proof required to get that across. So uh, the reason I'm emphasizing this point is because um, much of what's written in the book is just facts that is, you know, accepted if you're not from Florida. Uh, the concept of emasculation of the black male is well documented, right? And if you and if you think that that doesn't include unwanted acts of homosexuality plus, you know, wanted acts of homosexuality, if you think that somehow during slavery there were no homosexuals, Right, that would just mean that you're an idiot. Um, but that's kind of a different question. So anyway, um, let's 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 back this up with some things that he actually says. So on page thirty, and here we're going to use the the old go to page, right? On page thirty, Woodard says um, the homosexual. <laughs> What was that? The homosexual components of the feasting, partaking of the boiling pot of Negro soup, this is in reference to a cartoon earlier in the chapter, are less important to me than the race, racial assumptions, political aspirations, gender codes, philosophical frameworks, and cosmologies that dictated the feelings of arousal on the part of European and white American toward black males and hunger for black male flesh. The homosexual components of the feasting are less important, right? So this is why he's using homoeroticism over homosexuality. He's not actually talking about a sex act. Um, but he is talking about the ways in which uh, all of those other things feed into a white hunger for black, uh, black bodies, specifically black male flesh in this context. Uh, fine, but that does mean that, you know, we're going to have to... Um, not go out on a limb, but at least try to almost re-understand a word that has meant something different before. And, and again, you know, to the earlier point, like, why? You know? It, I already accept that uh, slavery was about hungering after black male bodies and female bodies. Um, what is this adding? You know? What is this framing adding is the question. So, you know, that that's... Again, this is Woodard's mission. That's why we're going over it. This is what he's laying out in the introduction. Okay. So then we have on page uh, 34, um, he talks about cannibalism. So that's the other side of the coin here, right? Cannibalism is the other, the other framework. And he says, I foreground, uh, I foreground same sex eroticism because it brings the focus to the issue of desire power and gender formation and helps me establish cannibalism as an originary framework for the emergence of homoeroticism out of the transatlantic slave trade and plantation culture. So there you go. So if you link page 30 to page 34, this hunger for the body, right, develops, which he's labeling homoeroticism, and that then establishes cannibalism. Again, fine. It, if I just use different words, isn't this the same thing? You know, what what, what is this framing adding? Um, okay. And then uh, on page 38, the... So he, you know, that's the other thing too. He argues a lot against... Um, because this book isn't like a piece of activism, right? He's This is an academic work where he's trying to find something that hasn't been said before. So he's arguing against others who have come before him. So on page 38, he quotes a person who's on you know, the same side um, in this quote-unquote debate, 
just to point out where his work is different. And he says, uh, Francis White is the person who he's going to refer to here. He says, furthermore, she advocates that we inquire uh, with Morrison-like curiosity why, histori why historians have presented the African past as if only sexual concerns that black men had during slavery were castration and whether they could protect and, for some, control black women's bodies. But earlier in this passage, he says that uh, a black feminist again, her name is E. Francis White, had admitted that for her and many others, the issue of homosexuality during slavery brings to the surface ambivalent feelings. And I guess this is me now, after, you know, 15 minutes of podcast, admitting that I feel a bit guilty about that, because I am ambivalent to it. And the reason I'm ambivalent to it is because it, if you told me it happened, I would go, sure, it happened. Um, just tack that on to all of the other horrible shit that happened that it was all happening um and then you know unless it's documented it becomes harder for me to really uh you know care like it's bad castration was bad uh black women being raped by slave owners was bad i just have enough bad stuff already so that's where the ambivalence comes from but if there can be a, con uh, you know, convincing, compelling, that doesn't even have to be that. Just show me that it happened. I don't even care. Just show me. And I will also say it's bad. Or even don't show me and just tell me, like, it probably happened and I will go it's bad. Um, so, you know, uh, I think that's basically my position. And then, uh, you know, just to put a bow on this and why it is kind of a problem is on page 39, um... Woodard basically addresses everything I just said. Many have argued that there are simply not enough primary uh, primary materials available to conduct such a study. Contrary, though, to these claims of absence, I argue that homoeroticism did exist among 19th century black peoples, chattel or free, literate or non-literate, though a number of factors have prevented us from being able to discern and engage with the subject of homoeroticism as it existed then. And, and again, uh... I don't disagree that, you know, it did exist. It's just that I'm like the people that he's mentioning in that first sentence who are probably fellow academics to, uh, you know, Vincent Woodard. Doesn't seem to be enough primary materials. So um, this is going to be an exercise in excavation from here on out. And we really will just see... Um, we'll really just see how successful he is in doing that. Now, before we move on to chapter one, I do have one final critique of the book. And actually, it's not of the book. It is of myself. Because here's the truth. I picked up a book called The Delectable Negro. And I wanted to read about white people eating black people. I mean, that's the fact of the matter. Now, once sounds weird here. But on some level, that's the truth. Part of this is academic and intellectual curiosity. But... Surely, some of it is the same morbid itch that is scratched by true crime podcasts, right? Like, you listen to a true crime podcast because you're like, oh, I hope that they caught that person. But if they didn't commit a crime, you're not listening to the podcast, right? And if the crime is like, like there's this podcast called like uh, Biggest Scandal or whatever. And I listened to it and I was like, oh, this is not salacious enough. I don't care. Um... So, taken through that lens, my earlier critiques have a little bit of a gross subtext to them. Um, you told me that they was going to get eight. I want to see them get eight. Right? That's really what's up. You know, I don't want a, a reading, a capitalistic uh, or a Marxist reading of, of slavery. I want the primary sources. I don't want metaphors. So... If the first three critiques were somewhat academic or philosophical, this last is about entertainment and how that's a weird thing to critique in this book, right? That's just weird. Um, and what can you really do? I mean, that's that's the thing. I, I came to this book uh, via Twitter where somebody said black people used to get eaten by white slave owners. That's what I came in expecting. Then I got hit with an introduction that was like, well, actually philosophically, metaphorically speaking, it's like, um, okay, not quite what I was looking for, but okay, all right, so that's the introduction, that's what the book is going to mainly be about, let's move to the first chapter, which is called Cannibalism in Transatlantic Context, and, 
Okay, so right off the... So this... This chapter, just to summarize, I would say, mainly deals with the concept that different groups of Africans viewed Europeans as cannibals and justifies that idea. It doesn't... Woodard seeks to not have that idea dismissed as the musings of a primitive folk, which I don't think it should be. I will say, I do think it should be dismissed as the musings of ignorant people. Which is to say, everybody dealing with, with each other in the, that time, right? Because it wasn't just Africans who thought that the white people were cannibals. The white people thought Africans were cannibals, and that shit lasted up until like the 20th century. I mean, I read an Agatha Christie book last year um, where they go to South Africa and Rhodesia. And they're still talking about cannibals. And that book was written in like 1920 something. So uh, when I say ignorant, I mean literally ignorant. They just don't know of the people that they're interacting with. So to me, it's not insulting to say, oh yeah, um, the Gambian people or the, uh, I think he also quotes the uh, people of Niger or the Mindy people thought the white folks were cannibals. Seems like every time anybody interacted with anybody back in the day, they're like, oh, you know what? They probably eat people. Um, that seems to be a, not like <laughs> literally every time, but a relatively common idea. Uh, Woodard's argument basically boils down to the idea that this wasn't unfounded because um, consumption equals cannibalism. But let's dig in a little bit deeper than that. The book starts off right away with a Mindy incident and Woodard says the Mindy were scared of the cannibalistic whites, but for that statement, he does not pr provide a footnote. So I have to assume, and he's, the book is footnoted, you know, wonderfully throughout, aside from that statement. So I have to assume there the cannibalistic idea is um, his reading of the situation, not anything that was a first-hand account. However, on page 47 and page uh, 51, we do get accounts of literal first-hand accounts where um, they say this one is Otobo, Otoba uh, Kuguano. He says, we came to a town where I saw several white people, which made me afraid that they would eat me according to our notion as children in the inland parts of the country. I mean, again, Woodard is going to argue against these people's very own words because Otoba, Otoba would eventually become free, learn how to read, write, all of that, and, you know, basically say, I put this childish notion of them as cannibals away, right? When I was a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, anyway. Uh, okay, and then on page 51, uh, this is um, an African youth who's talking in uh, a different uh, narrative, and he says, I asked them if we were not to be eaten by those white men with horrible looks, red faces, and long hair. I mean, that's almost, you know, to the T, like, I've never seen anybody look like that. Why do they look like that? They're probably going to eat me. Um, so, okay, but again, Woodard's not unfamiliar with this concept. Um, but it does leave me unconvinced, right? This seems like a point of view that a lot of people had. Uh, and yeah, so, okay. So later Woodard recounts, um, Gambians hidden upon the idea in the specifically Gambians. Uh, so the other two, you know, different, I think he just said they were West Africans, right? So he didn't exactly know which country, but later he recounts Gambians hidden upon the idea of cannibalism after repeated contact, right? So this was more, um, you know, as he's transitioning away from, cause it's easy to say like, oh, I saw this person once and, uh, or, you know, first contact thought they were cannibal, cannibals, but, you know, I was disabused of this notion. Well, the Gambians weren't, and um, they they said that they thought that the ship that they came in was, like, something that they worshipped and that they were, and that they were cannibals. Um, I just also find this unconvincing because it sounds more like, you know, capitalism to me. Um, oh, excuse me, that wasn't the people of Gambia, that was the people of... Niger. They were the ones who looked at the slave ship as an object of worship. But either way, both of those countries had repeated contact. So that was the idea there, Woodard saying, repeated contact, and yet they still felt that these people were, were cannibals. Uh, 
I can sum up my argument against all of this on, which is on page 48. Uh, Mia White says it, and again, um, you know, this all to say Woodard is very much um, aware of the problems with his arguments, if he thinks they're problems at all. Uh, Mia White says, um, such beliefs, she attributes such beliefs to traditional African tribal animosities that place the imputation of cannibalism on distrusted foreign peoples. Again, I would say that's, you know, a lot of people back in the day. And to that fact that Africans, taken by the Europeans, were usually never seen again, Bay concludes that African misapprehensions about white cannibalism were not real. Rather, she finds them to be based in a distorted historical vision, a viewpoint easily corrected with, quote-unquote, facts. I would say that uh, this is not incorrect, right? And that um, the only difference between Mia White's reading, my reading, and plenty of other scholars' readings from Woodard's reading is that Woodard is changing the definition of cannibalism, right? To encompass consumption, and in doing so, he can say that there was really an astute observation being made by um, these African peoples, right? So I think I have that highlighted on page 71. He says... Um, no, it's not on page 71. It's on a different page where he, he talks about how this is... Oh, okay, here we go. What differing African persons and groups universally recognized in Europeans whom they accused of being cannibals was a state of greed, gluttony, appetite, jealousy, and anger that I reached dangerous, unchecked, psychic, and spiritual proportions. To dismiss African obser observances that Europeans were cannibals as myth and superstition is to miss this very valuable and poignant insight into human capacity and a moral potential implicit in most indigenous African cosmologies and esoteric sciences of human consumption. You know, I, there's nothing wrong with that. That's all true. I, I don't think it would take the genius to realize that these people were, uh, you know, insanely greedy and had reached, um, what was his exact phrase? I liked it a lot. Um, they, they had akin to reached a dangerous, unchecked psychic and spiritual proportions, right? Greed of unchecked psychic and spiritual proportions. Uh, yeah, I do think African people recognize that. I think that, you know... I think it's the Taino Indians um, probably recognized that when they started chopping off their limbs if they didn't bring them enough gold. So I, I don't, um, again, it just seems like a, a, to me at least, to me it seems like a kind of pointless distinction between this consumption and, ca and cannibalism. I already think consumption is evil. The idea of it being tied to cannibalism is marginally interesting. Um, but, we shall see. So, okay. Uh, two more things on this chapter, and then we're going to move on to the bits and bobs. And, yeah, so the two more things in this chapter are that at some point, uh, Woodard does quote Carl O. Williams, who talks about the idea of the master, the slave master, as a human parasite. Just one more time, this is me reiterating that, yeah, I don't really think you're going to get any pushback on that. Um, but finally, I'd say the only part in chapter one where we get a real, like, oh, wow, this is something I didn't know about. This is cannibalism. This is crazy. Uh, and I would say this is the only part in the entire chapter where that happens, right? Other than that, to me, I'm not getting any of that in the first chapter. What I'm reading is, oh, this was very bad. I already knew it was bad. You're calling it cannibalism. That's fine. You're telling me that African peoples were perceptive enough to realize that the Europeans who came to enslave them or enslave some of them, uh, that the Africans were perceptive enough to be like, oh my God, uh, these people have lost their fucking mind. That doesn't, that's not a stretch. I, of course I would believe that. So... Maybe that's something, though, that should be pointed out to more people, so that's good. But the framing of it being cannibalistic and the importance of saying that them using the word cannibals or thinking that they were going to get eight is somehow, like, more important than just realizing that these people had basically devolved into pure evil uh, is not, I think, truly an important distinction. But here on page 61, we finally arrive at something that is truly different that I had never read before. 
um, or heard of. It was common practice in the Caribbean to not only cut off the ears of slaves, right? I knew about that, right? Cutting off body parts, famously in the miniseries Roots. It's on a lot of postcards from lynchings in the South. So uh, that's not surprising. <sighs> Sad. It was common practice in the Caribbean to not only cut off the ears of slaves, but to also broil them. And make the slaves eat the broiled pieces as punishment. Anglican missionary John Wesley documented this phenomenon in his Thoughts Upon Slavery. He writes, after they, after they are whipped till they are raw all over, some put pepper and salt upon them, some drop melted wax upon their skin, others cut off their ears and constrain them to broil and eat them. Um, that's nuts. You know, that's fucking crazy. And to me, this kind of arrives at the Kyrie corollary. Uh, this is so bad, I don't need another framework for it. This is just fucking terrible and upsetting. Um, it's worse than if a white person was eating them. It's much worse. It's like a thousand times worse. Uh, Woodard does kind of address this, like, the next paragraph, or not the same paragraph, just at the end. He says... Um, the captain of the British Royal Navy conveyed, not only do we consume you, but we also make you consume each other. This is, the, to me, the first thing in this chapter that, um, that, that lends credence to Woodard's thesis. So that's my way of saying I'm still open-minded on the thesis. Uh, I was unconvinced by chapter one, but this thing at the end here, this idea making you eat your own fucking body that you're cutting off. Yeah, that, that counts as cannibalism. And then tying consumption, uh, I don't, I can't believe I have to attach this prefix to this word exterior, exterior, uh, consumption from auto consumption. Um, yeah, that's a hell of a thing. So, um, you know, there's credence to, to the thesis here. Um, I just want to say, this whole thing feels very weird. It feels very weird to argue against this book. Uh, but it's just that the framework seems odd to me. You know? Because what am I arguing against? It's all fucking horrible. Um, anyway, I'm sure me and Woodard, if he were still alive, would, would, would have a good conversation about this if I ever met him. And, uh... I'm still, you know, interested in the ideas in the book, so it's not, I'm not completely out on it or anything, um, but I do feel like it's mainly a framework and a metaphorical framework, and, um, and maybe could have just been a, a good, uh, piece of history book that didn't need the, uh, the, the cannibalism aspect of it in it, you know, or maybe not, maybe I'm just, you know, thinking too much about it. Uh, I'm more interested to see what he pulls up for the homoeroticism part and for homosexuality in general and how much primary sources there are. I wonder if there are any. Because um, 100%, like, the cannibalism thing is weird. Um, so, like, I could see it not existing. Like, if somebody told me, oh, there was cannibalism during slavery times, because I think slavery was horrible, I would go like, oh, yeah, probably or maybe, you know. Kind of like the 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 fighting between slaves where they used to put them together and fight. We're like apparently not a hundred percent sure that happened. Whereas the homosexuality thing, I, I, there's no real way for me to believe that that didn't happen. So my only question is, are there sources? That's it. Um, so in that way, it's different. But I'm I'm interested to see what he pulls up, and so we'll get to that in later chapters. Uh, okay, there's two things that I found interesting. That have nothing to do with um, with Woodard's theses. Theses. Uh, the first one is on page fifty-two. It still has to do with black people, so we'll go with it. And it says the Negro was, after all, thought of as quote the lady of the races end quote a more effeminate species compared to the Anglo-Saxon. Uh, I'm gonna gonna go on a short rant here. Let me see what time we're at here. We're at thirty-four minutes. Yeah, very short rant. Um, this is just interesting to me because I, I know that before Jack Johnson won the world heavyweight title and things like that, there was a perception that um, black people also weren't like good athletes or as strong and stuff like that. 
Uh, well, clearly we were strong, but not good enough athletes or whatever, more effeminate, something like that, some weird stuff that they thought. And born out over time now, of course, people don't think that black people are effeminate. They think they're like uber masculine, like um, sex demons, right? Especially black men, but black women too. We're all hyper masculinized uh, sex demons um, who can jump 40 inches and like, you know, this crazy sex stamina. That's, that's what we are now. But before we were the, the lady of the races. And it's interesting that, um, I think intellectually, if I was a person who was dumb enough to believe in like race science, right, that you wouldn't look at like how the notions towards, um, black physicality and, uh, black, um, you know, uh, the black nature, the idea of them as lady of the races, how that's flipped, you know, and, and, and naturally so, and just like was clearly a product of um, many other things, but nothing to do with, like, something inherent, right? Nothing to do with race. Um, how you wouldn't extend that to, like, intelligence, because that's coming up again. And I'm not going to dig into it. I, I decided today after reading an article about uh, the, what will hopefully be the last time I ever read about IQ again, um, that in 2023 I'm not going to dig into it. Uh, there is no point. You can't prove it to people. They're either, you know, not dumb or they're dumb. And that's it. Because just as an intellectual exercise, if you look at something like this, where it was like, hey, 150 years ago, we thought this about black people, but slowly that, that, uh, notion dissipated. Or if you point out the idea of race as a construct or all of the different, you know, genetic stuff or any of the science or any of that stuff or how the IQ test isn't reliable. You would just think, though, like, if, even if you didn't believe any of that, just the simple, like, oh, yeah, we used to think this about this race, but over time we stopped thinking that about this race. And the reason is because, like, there's no, it's not actually tied to race, right? Like, the race thing is tied to culture, uh, you know, like, anybody who's black in America is actually just following a cultural trend and a way of being with uh, intentional blackness. They're not following something that's in their their genes. There is no there is no one hundred percent pretty much black person in America that goes back several generations, right? That that's all. We're Africans of the blood in part, and that's it. So we already done had the race mixing. Um, so my point being, there is no pure black American. Uh, it would be dumb to assume that race, which we made up, but especially in America where it's, everybody's been race mixing, plays a factor in our, black people's ability to be intelligent or good at sports or effeminate or masculine. And we've seen these things borne out through time, right? We've seen the IQ gap shorten and we've seen uh, the idea of black people being effeminate uh, flipped on its head. That's the point there. Anyway, just thought the Lady of the Races was interesting. The other thing that I thought was interesting to get away from black folks for a minute is on page 55. In Consuming Passions, The Anthropology of Eating, Peter Farb and George Armologo note that tastes do not just emerge as full-blown realities. Rather, they emerge from a complex of historical and cultural forces brought to bear upon a culinary object. Quote, Cultural, historical, and ecological events have interacted, they write, to cause frogs, for example, to be esteemed as a delicacy in southern China, but to be regarded with revulsion in northern China. Friends, these people have never been to China. Or if they have... They talked to seven Chinese people. You can get frog everywhere. Everywhere. I've never been anywhere in China where I couldn't get frog. I guess maybe like, I visited Qingdao. I'm trying to wonder, trying to remember if I specifically saw frog. Probably not at a seafood restaurant because it's not seafood. Uh, and that's really what they have in Qingdao. But the idea that frog isn't everywhere is absolutely nuts. Um... And this is a minor thing. I'm not saying that the overall idea isn't right. And maybe it was true when they wrote the book. I, I don't know. 
but you can get frog everywhere and it's great. You should, you should get, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, um, which is, uh, wait, gan guo, uh, which is, um, like bullfrog, spicy, uh, dry pot bullfrog, um, yeah, anyway, uh, completely has nothing to do with the book, but you can get frog everywhere, uh, okay, and, yeah, tasty, uh, all right, so that's gonna do it for today, um, next week, we will do, literally next week, not two weeks, I know I say next week a lot, but, um, I do mean next week. We will do two chapters, uh, Sex, Honor, and Human Consumption, interesting, and A Tale of Hunger Retold, Ravishment and Hunger in uh, Frederick Douglass's Life and Writing. So that'll be interesting, and I'll probably dig into a little Frederick Douglass on the side. For this one, I didn't dig into anything on the side, like usually these kind of books lead me to other texts and then I just get lost. But I didn't really have to here. But for Frederick Douglass, I might have to. So, yeah, that's that's on the docket for um, next week. In the meantime, uh, let's do some shameless plugging. I haven't been shameless plugging myself enough. So, uh, in the show notes, there's a link to the book I wrote. It's called Playing in the Sand. It's about a comedian who starts a cult, as comedians are wont to do. So check that out. There's also a link to my other writings if you just want to read some other writings. But it's hard out there for the literary mag, so some of them are down. Um, But uh, some of them are up, so, you know, those those are there. And, yeah, the... Oh, please rate, uh, subscribe, and review the podcast on your favorite podcasting app. I use Pocket Cast, but, you know, Apple Podcasts and... uh, Spotify are the big ones. We're there too. And on YouTube as well. And then the music is by The Keep Running. Also in the show notes. Check them out. And yeah. That's everything. So until next time. uh, Stay safe. Stay black. And keep reading. That's not fair. That's not fair at all. There was time now. There was was all the time I needed. That's not fair. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs>